let all things <laughs> make a joyful noise <laughs> unto the Lord. <laughs> can we just start off saying, praise the Lord? Can, can we just like, can, can we do a hand clap? Can we do a shout? Can you worship God in this moment in the way that you worship God? And whatever name you give to God, can we worship today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have made it another day and to this place. Uh, I would want to ask you all to, if you could rise to your feet, if you are able, and turn to your uh, bulletins to the first page. We have our call to worship. Um, I will uh, do the uh, unbolded print. You all handle the, the bolded. Can you handle that? Can you got it? All right. In joy, in hope, in gratitude, here we gather. Here we gather as one body. We gather in anticipation of great things, of beauty, depth, meaning, and inspiration. Let us gather in openness to the ever surprising, the ever unpredictable, the ever wonder making movement of the Spirit into this blessed moment. We come to witness to the whisper that has stirred souls up through the ages. We come to witness to the hope of life, to live lives, to witness of God. Here we gather in gratitude, in hope, in joy. Come and let us worship. Amen and amen. Please look to the second page. We have our hymn right coming up.
Please be seated. Grace and peace to you and welcome to Sweeney Chapel for tonight's baccalaureate service. Whether you have come here to worship often in this chapel or are here for the first time, it's my joy to welcome you and to invite you to return at any and every opportunity. Commencement is only a few hours away. And the goal for which these graduates have worked is in view. Tomorrow, they will process into Shelton Auditorium. Tomorrow, they will walk across the stage and receive their diplomas and celebrate in various ways and thank the people who have journeyed with them and leave their mark on this community, and then turn toward what comes next. Tomorrow will be a great day. It'll be the day that the Lord has made, and there will be much rejoicing in it. But so is today, the day the Lord has made. And before tomorrow comes, we gather tonight in worship, inspiration, and community to give thanks to God who so wondrously reigneth, to open our lives again to the pure and bounded love that's at the center of the universe, to ground our vocation and our purpose in that great and most interesting caller of all whose stirrings you first experienced among you and within you on your way to Christian Theological Seminary. Tonight, we worship. Tonight, we trust in God's presence and God's leading so that tomorrow we may faithfully turn to what comes next with our whole being. Let us now continue our worship with the prayer of thanksgiving. Well, let us bow our heads and pray. Eternal God, we come to you this evening with joyful hearts, full of gratitude and humility in response to your awesome grace and loving mercy. As we celebrate the blessing of graduation, we have to pause and reflect on how we got here. And first, God, we have to acknowledge our professors and seminary staff and classmates, pastors, church family, and friends who have helped us in so many different ways. Whether it was a much needed hug, a kind word, or time spent in prayer on our behalf, God, for these wonderful people, we say thank you. And God, we have to reflect on our loved ones who have stood by us, our spouses, our children, our parents, and others who read through our papers and listened to our sermons and watched our PowerPoint presentations and supported us every step of the way. We remember them tonight, oh God, for their sacrifice, how they gave up time with us and time together so that we could pursue our call. For our families, oh God, we say thank you. And finally, oh God, we have to pause to personally reflect on our life's journey that got us to this point. We pause to reflect on every evil plan that was devised to stop us from seeing this day. Oh God, we reflect on the weapons that were surely formed against us, 
Whether it was a schoolyard bully from our childhood or a habit that we couldn't break in our adulthood, a systemic problem in our society that tried to hold us down, whether it was low finances, bad romances, or unfavorable circumstances, God, we reflect on that fact because you, oh God, brought us through all of those. You didn't allow any of those weapons to prosper. When we struggled, you were there. When we felt like giving up, you were there. When we felt inadequate, you were there. And as we look back over this chapter in our lives, we read through the pages in our minds. We see that you were there between each line and every page of our story. And now as we turn the page to a new chapter, oh God, we now, we want to know that we know that you will be there too, God. What I'm trying to say is that we know we didn't make it here all by ourselves. We had some help, oh God, and for that help, we say thank you. And all of our help, we know, comes from you. Our help comes from the Lord. Our families come from the Lord. Our strength comes from the Lord. Our intellect comes from the Lord. All of our help, God, comes from you. And God, we know that we never, we never would have made it without you. We never could have made it without you. Say something, somebody. And now, because of you, we're stronger. We're wiser and we're better. And for that, oh God, we say thank you. Thank you, oh God. Thank you for this day and thank you for this blessing. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let the graduates say amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome the Reverend Dr. Lorinda Hafner back home to Christian Theological Seminary. Reverend Hafner earned her Master of Divinity degree from CTS as well as a D-Min from McCormick Theological Seminary and has put her theological training to use in remarkable ways. Reverend Hafner has served as the senior pastor of Coral Gables Congregational UCC in Coral Gables, Florida since 2006. Prior to her current pastorate, she served as the senior pastor of Pilgrim Congregational UCC in Cleveland, Ohio for 17 years, where she was named by the Cleveland Plain Dealer as, quote, one of those who will help to shape our lives in the new millennium. Reverend Hafner's commitments to leading by the imperative to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God have guided her ministry service in congregation and communities. She has also served on the board of Eden Theological Seminary and the United Church Federation and has chaired the Miami Coalition of Christians and Jews Clergy Dialogue. Reverend Hafner is married to Richard Walters, a fellow CTS alum, and they are the very proud parents of their college-age daughter, Sienna. You will hear more about Reverend Hafner's accomplishments tomorrow during the graduation ceremony. But tonight, I invite you to sit back and listen to the word of God that will be proclaimed through this wonderful woman of God. And as we prepare to hear from Reverend Hafner, I also want to take a moment to give thanks to our graduates who have served our chapel so faithfully. So as they're preparing to come and offer a selection for us, we want to give special thanks to Jason Powell, Molly DeWitt, Leah Yen, Paula pettis and Alex Pittaway. There's a 
God that walks over the earth He's searching for a heart that is desperate And longing for a child that will give him their all Give it all, he wants it all And he says, love me Love me with your whole heart He wants it all today Thank you. That was a blessing. Blessing. Thank you. So hear the words from the prophet Jeremiah, what he witnessed in the hands of the potter. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw her working at the wheel. But the pot she was shaping with the clay was marred in her hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to her. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, grace and peace to each of you as we gather in the name of the one who has brought us together this evening in unexplainable, surprising, and I suspect for many of you, unexpected ways. 
As I look out upon you, some of the members of the graduating class of 2018, I wonder how many of you are still trying to figure out how this all happened. Yet I suspect that way down deep, you know it was the only thing that could happen. For when God calls, well, you know. With sincere thanks to Interim President Bill Kincaid for this amazing opportunity to address you, the graduates this evening, as well as your family and friends who surround you with such love and pride, to Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty, Leah Gunning Francis, who I have had the privilege of getting to know over the years and I admire so much. And to the faculty and staff of CTS, many of whom I suspect have kept the tradition going from when I was a student here of messing with your minds and your presumptions, your faith, and your lives. And now, you stand on the cusp of going forth as pastors and teachers and faith leaders to mess with other people's faith and presumptions and lives and minds. I am especially touched to be here as this week actually marks the 39th anniversary of my own graduation from these hallowed halls where I somehow was able to convince the professors who sat at the table of my X815 course, do you still have that, where they sit around the table with you and question your fitness for ministry, that I was indeed fit and ready to leave here and go and shepherd a flock. And they actually let me, although I do suspect several of them did so with some great fear and trembling for the future of Christendom. So ironically, as many of you are gearing up to begin your own ministry, I'm kind of winding down. So this invitation has offered me the possibility and opportunity to reflect on these some 39 years since I threw a few possessions into my Plymouth duster and a book collection of Tillich and Whitehead and Williamson and Jansen and drove from Indianapolis into the adventure of a lifetime. And I have sincerely pondered and wondered what to faithfully share with you this evening. I have to admit that my first thought was to quote Winston Churchill who is said to have been introduced at a commencement address as one who will now share words of wisdom as you go forth into the world. Apparently, Churchill stood up, he went to the podium, and he simply said, don't go. <laughs> but I know that won't work for you. You have things to say, to preach, a vision of church and of the work that you are called to do and how you are going to do it. So you need to go. As I was thinking about these precious words to you, my eyes kept going to a sculpture that has sat on the many desks I have inhabited over these 39 years. Actually, it's a concrete garden sculpture that I found on the eve of my ordination that, that called to me in the same way that a great pair of shoes calls you or a particular book cover or a wine label calls you where you just kind of got to have it. Well, this sculpture is of a woman potter kneeling over a bowl that appears that she is creating. I thought it'd be perfect for the garden. But when I arrived home with it, my then boyfriend, who I actually met here and is now my husband, said, Lori, you don't have a garden. And so it has sat on my desk ever since. <laughs> I think even way back then, that what drew me to this sculpture were these graceful hands of the potter as she appears to be molding and shaping the bowl. As I was thinking about my message to you, I then chose as our text these words of Jeremiah, which speaks of a potter. But I wondered, 
what if the potter in Jeremiah's story was a woman? How might that change or shape the way that we hear these words and respond to them? And so in this slightly revised version of the passage, we heard in part, so I went down to the potter's house and there she was working at her wheel. The vessel she was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and she reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to her. What difference does it make indeed? Well, I decided to explore this image of the potter as a woman by doing some research, which for me mostly these days means Googling. So I typed into my little Google search box, women potters. And the first answer that popped up was Beatrice Potter. Not exactly what I was looking for, <laughs> but indeed a woman who is literally a potter. Now many of you might recognize Beatrice Potter as the author best known for her children's book, The Tale of Peter Rabbit. It just so happens that when my daughter was young, this was her all-time favorite book, the one that she would request over and over and over again. So I'm pretty well versed on this Peter Rabbit, a rather mischievous rabbit. Peter, unlike his rural abiding sisters, Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, would always test the societal boundaries set down between humans and animals, and he would get himself into what the author describes as some fine messes. Well, remembering this mischievous Peter Rabbit got me thinking about mischief making especially as it pertains to ministry and faith and even the church. I've always loved the words of the Sufi poet Hafiz who once asked, God, what love mischief can I do for the world today? You see, friends, sometimes we just need some good mischief making in the world and in the church and through our faith. We need mischief makers who test those deadly words of the church, but we've always done it this way, and who frankly help break a few stale, unproductive, maybe even harmful rules of faith. Those who are mischievous enough to dig deep into the gospel and use it to question what is thought to be normal and business as usual then choose instead to see the world in a whole different way, all for the sake of the gospel of love and of justice. I do think that part of ministry and faithfulness is not only to be a bit of a mischief maker yourself, but to help others bring a little love mischief to the church and to the world. Good mischief making helps turn things inside out and upside down, like peering out on the church and seeing the vision of a beloved community while doing all that is possible to widen the welcome and the work of the faithful. It's making theological stands by your statements, your convictions, your activities. It's joining with others in making known the evils of racism and sexism and classism and homophobia rather than some endless diatribe of doctrine. It's spreading the table of radical hospitality for all people, engaging others in social justice issues and sustainable action. It is raising new generations of church members who will make a world of difference. It's creating churches and places of ministry, as Annie Dillard has said, where we need to wear crash helmets and ushers issue life preservers and signal flares, where we need to be lashed to our pews because we invoke the very power of a God that is so strong and so dangerous that it can change and transform our lives and even the world around us. Go. 
Go and be creators of such holy mischief and agitators of comfort, not accepting the world or the church as it is, but rather insisting that it become what God wants and needs it to be. Now back to my extensive research on women potters. <laughs> Ironically, the second answer that appeared when I Googled women potters was Harry Potter. <laughs> now, while the character of Harry Potter, of course, is not a woman, the author of this very popular book series, J.K. Rollins, is. Her books tell the story of a friendship that develops among Harry and his Hogwarts schoolmates as together they navigate the rocky shoals of adolescence while developing their burgeoning magical skills. Together, as they learn to make magic, Harry and his friends draw on each other's strengths as well as accept each other's vulnerabilities and their mutual care, devotion, support makes their courage and boldness possible. Harry and his friends do not carry out their mission alone. They had to rely on one another to be community with each other. And so it is in ministry. While much of that journey as pastors is one that we make alone, it is always far richer when taken in the company of companions, literally meaning the ones we share bread with, our congregation. Always, always we have choices. We can live for ourselves or we can live for others. We can trust power or we can trust love. But I have come to believe that when we choose love and choose to share that love with others, there is magic. As the magician David Copperfield has said, the real secret of magic lies in the performance. So friends, each time you reach out to others and hold tightly or listen intently and pay attention or love extravagantly or open your hearts and forgive freely or work tirelessly or laugh at the absurd, magic happens. It's the magic of being Christ's hands, feet, eyes, and body in this world. Go, go and make some holy magic. Well, a final Google search of women potters actually did bring me to a genuine woman potter by the name of Kelly Jackson, who is the owner of Imperfect Pottery in Lexington, North Carolina. According to her website, Kelly believes the beauty in life comes from all of the imperfections. So each of her pieces is purposefully created to be a little crooked or uneven or marred. Which kind of brings us full circle back to our text of Jeremiah and these words. The pot she was shaping from the clay was spoiled, or as one translation has it, marred in her hands. Why was the pot marred? Well, maybe it was because the clay was too dry or it lacked the exact amount of moisture. But when the potter saw that the clay was broken, she didn't throw it out saying that it was useless, but she took that same clay and she molded it and she made something really good from it. Friends, you're now in the business of ministering to those with broken, chip, cracked, uneven places in their lives. And I will tell you, it's always a privilege and an honor to be invited into those intimate places of brokenness and suffering, for they are holy occasions of ministry. But let me remind you also of your own vulnerability, your own imperfection, your own weaknesses, where your own beauty and ability lies to help heal. For you are, as we all are, what Father Henry Nouwen once called wounded healers. And according to Nouwen, ministers of all kinds are called to identify the suffering in their own hearts and make that the starting point of their own service. Well, my dear friends, this weekend is a wonderful continuation 
of a journey that began perhaps a long while back when the restlessness of God's spirit challenged you to take an adventure in faith. You are indeed called to ministry in such a grand and as we saw once again today, awful time as the great hymn says, but I promise you, it will be a privilege of a lifetime to serve God, to serve others, and to use your beautiful, marred, amazing, imperfect lives to make some holy mischief and to practice some holy magic. May it indeed be so. Amen. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us that they will come from the east and from the west, from the north and the south, and all will sit at God's banquet table in the kingdom of God. According to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, and he gave it to them, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Friends, this is the Lord's table. It is not the table of CTS. It is not the table of any denomination. All are welcome at this table. As the psalmist tells us, taste and see that God is good. Would you pray with me, please? Loving God, there are reminders of your grace all around us. We gather around this table knowing that you have created us, that you have loved us, and that you have given us purpose. And even, Lord, when we fall short of your purposes for us, not only do you forgive us, but you call us back to your ways. You send family and friends and even prophets among us to remind us 
of our responsibilities to you, to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our beings, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in due season, at just the right time, in fact, while we were still sinners, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, who showed us a way of life, a life lived in relationship with you and with one another, a life of self-giving love. And persistently you beckon us again and again to model our lives after Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we gather around this table, we are reminded of your grace once again. As we share bread and cup together, remind us of the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and cup, so that they might become for us by faith the body and blood of Christ, and that in sharing together we may find ourselves again worthy of the calling that you have given to each of us. In the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Friends, I remind you that on the night in which Jesus was arrested, he gathered with his friends in an upper room, and he took a loaf of bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. And after supper, he took a cup and he poured it out in front of them and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it and remember me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see that God is good.
Friends, would you join me in prayer once more? Loving God, send us out from this place of worship to a life of worship, loving you with our whole selves and serving our neighbors. In the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. As we prepare for our Dean of Students, Reverend Mary Harris, to come and offer a blessing for all of our graduates, we would like to acknowledge all of our graduates as well as some of the award winners from this academic year. This year, our CTS Honors and Awards, our Biblical Studies Award, and the William R. Bill Duffy Theology Prize are awarded to Leah Yen. The History of Global Christianity Award is to Molly DeWitt. The Christianity and Culture Award goes to Cynthia Boudin Schaefer. Our Pastoral Theology and Psychology Awards for our Master in Family Therapy student goes to Linda Bush. The Pastoral Theology and Psychology Award for our Clinical Mental Health student goes to Diana Harrington. The Christian Ministries Award goes to both Preston Becker and Sheila Spencer. Our Perseverance Awards are given to Jason Powell and Linda Little. The Promise of Excellence in Ministry Award goes to Paula Pettis Garrett and John Ray. The Trustee Award to Graduating Students for High Academic Achievement goes to Linda Bush. We have several students that are members of the Delta Kappa Marriage and Family Therapy Honor Society. That includes Lacey Adams, Taylor Britton, Linda Bush, Amber Cowan, Donna Marino, Kim O'Connell, Aaron Persinger, and Barb Weatherspoon. We now want to welcome all of our graduates, beginning with our certificate in pastoral care to Hoying Richard. Our certificate to Lewis Weiss in abstentia, and certificate in marriage and family studies to Michael Montgomery. Our candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Marriage and Family Therapy, Barrick Brace, <laughs> Linda Bush, <laughs> Amber Cowan, <laughs> Donna Marino,
Ashley Boyd Minor. Michelle Spencer Pribble. Thaddeus Shelton Jr. Barbara Weatherspoon. Caitlin Whelan. Our candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Clinical, Clinical Mental Health Counseling, Elizabeth Anstek. Joshua Brainerd. Philip Graybeal. Diana Harrington. Lee Ivy the Third. Caitlin Jordan. Linda Little. Janine Matsi. And Laura Silence. Our candidate for the degree of Master of Theological Studies is a, will be awarded tomorrow in absentia to Sarah Frischmari Hannigan. The candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity, Preston Becker, Joshua Brainerd, Linda Bush, Molly DeWitt, Derek Fields, Sarah Frischmari Hannigan, Susan Hobson, Ashley Heyer, Lee Ivy the Third, Travis Jeffords, Linda Little, Zachary Mapes. Rachel McLaughlin, Michael Montgomery, Hisuk Park Magna, Paula Pettis Garrett, James Petty. Alex Pittaway, Jason Powell, John Ray Jr., Philip Rutledge, Cynthia Boone Schaefer. Sherry Session, Susan Schombaugh, Sheila Spencer, Amy Vanderford, Michelle Wood, and Leah Yen.
Our candidate for the degree of Doctor of Ministry is Lawrence Isbell. I invite Reverend Harris to come and offer a blessing to our graduates. Well, well. <laughs> this old earth has re had a number of revolutions since we first met. And, and a number of meanings of revolution. Alas, I have to confess, we've held the secret since we first met you. From the first time we began seeing each other, I mean, it really was a courtship. From the beginning, we knew that you would be a gift to us at CTS. There were early signs, letters, emails, timid glances in the hallway, <laughs> and then sometimes you would call us by name. And finally, meetings over dinner. It was a courtship. As in any courtship, there were good times and bad times. <laughs> Tears and celebrations. But tonight, we celebrate. We believed in you and watched as the gift that you brought to CTS grew and bloomed. You've become family, and you leave, leave us changed for the better. If today's news is any indication, the world needs you as soon as we can release you. For several of you, and I promise not to name names, I have little doubt that you can be mischief makers. <laughs> and so I say, go now into your dreams and callings. Continue to make us proud of you and share your gifts. To borrow a line from one of my favorite songs, I'll simply say, your time has come to fly. All your dreams are on their way. Friends, you are a bridge over troubled waters. Amen. If you will take your steps now back, realizing for the first time you are alums of the school.